Hey, sorry for the interruption, but we wanted to let you know that this week's episode is brought to you by Spotify for Podcasters. Really cool app. Josiah and I use it for every single show that we bring to you every week. You can edit podcasts right from your phone or computer so you can start creating as soon as you log into the platform. You can easily distribute your podcasts to Spotify and everywhere else the podcasts are heard, just like we do every single week. You can also create video podcasts on Spotify, which is really cool. And of course, you can earn money like I'm doing right now by including ads and even podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free. There's no catch. We really love it. We use it every single week. So we encourage you to go download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. All right, let's get back to the show. Radical. Welcome to this week's episode of the Print on Demand cast. Each week, join the gnarly Travis and Josiah as they provide insight into the print on demand industry and equip you with the totally tubular tools, advice, and strategies you need to achieve success and hopefully have a few laughs along the way. Now, on to this week's totally tubular show. Welcome back to the Print On Demand cast. My name is Josiah, and usually I have Travis Ross with me here, but Travis is actually on vacation. Uh, he left last Friday, which is on my birthday, uh, to go to sunny, beautiful Mexico. I guess uh, the invitation was lost in the mail uh, for me to join them on uh, my birthday to go to Mexico with them, but that, that that didn't happen, and it's not that I'm bitter or salty or anything like that. It's just that I'm getting to enjoy and embrace the delightful weather selection of Colorado right now, which happens to be overclass, cloudy, and rainy at intermittent times, but hey, it is what it is, right? So today we decided that uh, we're just going to do another rebroadcast. We had another episode lined up for you guys, part two of um, the you know conversation with Tate, uh, that we we're going to air, you know, as the production manager and kind of talk more about his job. Um, we got good feedback from episode one, so we wanted to go into episode two. But Tate uh, called in this morning. He is sick, so uh, he's not going to be able to make it to record. So uh, I'm sitting here on a Monday uh, recording this uh, new intro for you guys to tell you that the episode that we have coming up for you is from episode. 55, the interview we have uh, for you, rather, is from episode 55 of the Print on Demand cast. And we had Nick Eden on the show. And I can tell you, I absolutely loved this interview. It's one of my favorite interviews that we've ever uh, done. You know, it's called Advanced Beginner Strategies with Nick Eden. And uh, it aired on September 8th. And it is a fantastic fantastic show uh, and there's so much for you guys to glean and learn from it so we're super excited to uh, let you guys listen to give you insight into this interview if you haven't heard it before if you have heard it before i guarantee you this is one of those interviews that you're going to want to listen to again because there is so much to learn so without any further ado we're going to go ahead and go straight into the interview with nick eden <laughs> Some main event. Talk about your prince. They're sitting on the fence. This is a main event. All right, Travis, for this week's main event, I'm excited to welcome Nick Eden. And for our listeners, uh, just a little bit about Nick Eden before we bring him on so we know who we're talking to. Uh, Nick Eden is a six figure e commerce seller, primarily in the realm of print on demand. Uh, he's the host of a Morning Cup of Merch podcast, which is a weekly podcast dedicated to teaching new sellers how to start and grow their print on demand business. So we're excited to welcome Nick Eden, a fellow podcaster, here to the podcast, the, B the POD cast, print on demand cast. Nick, welcome to the show and thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to join us. Thank you for having me. Travis and I have been talking about this for a while. I'm, I'm glad we can finally get together. <laughs> Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah, I actually met you on Clubhouse, I think. I know you'd been in the Merch by Amazon world and kind of even done some podcasts and have kind of like everybody knew you, but I wasn't necessarily in that world. I kind of had a different route to get, you know, uh, to where to where we're at today and um, actually met you on Clubhouse. We started chatting, started connecting, and then I found your podcast and then you took a break 
for i was like <laughs> yeah. oh i just found this guy and he's like <laughs> gone all of a sudden but then you came back and i remember when you came back i messaged you after i listened to that first episode when you came back and dude you laid it down there was some good oh, nuggets in there it was it was good and i mean uh, i don't know do you remember what episode it is so we can kind of tell our listeners to go check it out it was leveraging your uh, PLD business for B2B success. And so yeah. that was a part of the reason that I actually took a break. Um, and I know it's so I started the podcast um, originally it was called the 4554 podcast. Um, mm-hmm. And that was based around the fact that, you know, the dimensions for merch by Amazon were uh, 4,500 mm-hmm. by 5,400, but they mm-hmm. could be used on other platforms. So in my mind, I was like, hey, that's a way that, you know, it's the same thing. The things I talk about can primarily be around merch by Amazon, but you can use them everywhere, right? Mm, yeah. Um, and so I did that for a while. I took a break from the 4554 podcast. And then while I was doing that, I was working, uh, I'm in coastal Mississippi. I'm right, right by Biloxi, Mississippi, where all the casinos mm-hmm. are. Uh, but I was doing some work in, in New Orleans. So I was going back and forth there every day. And so and this is this may sound crazy. I hope nobody has me committed, but you know, sometimes you have these <laughs> ideas and you start, you know, kind of speaking out loud. And after a while, I was like, I should really record this. And so I started doing just kind of like these 15, 20 minute daily drive videos. And because mm-hmm. I'm a coffee lover and I always had my coffee with me, I just called it morning cup of merchant and just kind of stuck. Mm-hmm. And so when I merged them um earlier this year, I ended up taking a break. Um, and I did that for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first reason was because with the podcast in itself, what what I remember specifically, what made me start the original podcast was that at the time, this was like mid-2017, everybody was in all the Facebook groups and everybody mm-hmm. was doing, you know, you had a yep. lot of new people. And most of us, like myself, came from reselling or private label. Yeah. I had actually been doing print on demand um, with Teespring and, uh, and Redbubble, but, you know, we were all new to Merch by Amazon. But and everybody's posting all these great screenshots of their huge numbers <laughs> and all these tear ups. But the people who were in the 10 and 25 tier, you know, the people that are just trying to get that first payout, you know, yeah. that first sale, they're like, look, this is great. It's inspirational, but nobody's talking to me. And I started talking to that person. Um, and that's and that's just really how it came up. So that being said. For me, the biggest thing was every time I sit in front of this camera, every time I sit and pull up this microphone to my mouth, I want to make sure that I'm adding legitimate value and not giving fluff. And if I'm yeah. not adding legitimate value, then I just need to mm. shut up for a while. Right. Wow. And and that's and as much as print on demand has changed, it's become a lot more competitive in, in a lot of ways. It's gotten a lot better in a lot of ways. It's gotten worse. You know, me trying to find my way. One, I was really burned out by the Facebook groups and even some of the stuff that was going on on clubhouse. But in addition to that, I was kind of transitioning some of the things that I was doing that just kind of was not so centered on the, the rat race of the PLD marketplaces like Amazon and Etsy and merch. I mean, and uh, Redbubble, and you know, that's still in the realm that I love. I love this business, but I know that there's just no one way to do it. Right. And so that's why I took a break. I had some things to do, get myself, you know, together mentally, uh, trying out mm. these new ventures. And then I'm like, okay, now that I'm back, let me talk about it. And I was excited yeah. to talk about it in that first episode because yeah. it's opened up a completely different door where you're just leveraging and you're doing B2B. And me coming from a sales and marketing background, I was like, this is the best of both worlds. I have a product that I truly love doing. I love the process mm. of print on demand. Mm-hmm. I can also do sales very well. And now that I've merged the two, I'm not worried about tear ups anymore. I'm not worried yeah. about, yeah. you know, I'm not worried about any of that crap. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm still in my merch account. I still love it. I still love merch by Amazon and mm-hmm. Redbubble and, and spring and, and all those things. But I, I feel like there's an entire realm that we're missing. And a lot of people are because they see the, the, the YouTube thumbnails and it always talks about passive income and not having mm. to leave your house and not dealing with customers. <laughs> and you're yeah. leaving so much money on the table. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, it, it's, it's amazing because yeah. the concept of print on demand, as you all know, is so new still. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's not new in terms of an in industry, but in terms of the, the mass exposure of it. Right. You know, right. People in my everyday life that have known me for years still fundamentally do not understand what it is that I do. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so yeah. 
<laughs> it, it gives you this opportunity to to introduce this to folks and, and and it's a concept particularly for business owners who've been used to the old model of screen printing it blows their mind and mm -hmm. it and it puts it makes you an expert in this space so yeah that's what made me come back and i i i, I remember when i finished that episode i was like Man, I went back and watched the episode like several times before I even posted it. I, like, yeah, I was on fire for this one. Yeah, you were. I remember I was literally, literally driving in my car and I'm like, yes, Nick, yes. You know, I'm talking out loud in my car, you know, by myself. And I was excited too, man. I Because, you know, you hear, like you said, you hear all of this fluff. You know, there's a lot of stuff. I mean, I'm sure there's fluff that has, has you know, been on the print on demand cast, you know I mean? It's just, you hear so much noise, I guess. And it, it was really refreshing for someone to just say, Hey, you're leaving money on the table. In fact, Josiah and I, before, um, earlier when we were talking, we were talking about some future episodes we want to do. And that that's literally the title of one of the episodes we want to do, you know, yeah. how much money are you leaving on the table and, and talk about the different ways that people can take advantage of this huge opportunity that we have with print on demand that, like you said, a lot of people don't understand it. We need yeah. to educate them before they really can, you know, understand it. But then once we educate them, we're trusted by them and then can sure. potentially take advantage of that, uh, that opportunity to make a sale or to, to make a relationship that continues to make sales over time. So there's, there's a lot to that. And I, I really do want to get into that and we will, yeah. we're going to, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but before we do, let's, let's, let's uh, get in our time machine and go back to, you know, <laughs> early Nick Eden. And uh, let's hear like, wh where, where did you go to, did you go to college for any of this stuff or, you know, did you, what, what did you do before you were in uh, e-commerce and just kind of let's, let's talk about Nick. Post or uh, pre POD? Yeah. So what's funny is I learned graphic design in college, even though I went for communications. Uh, hmm. So I attended Alabama State University in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, while I was there, like I really spent all of my. So I'm aging myself here a little bit. Uh, <laughs> Coming out of high school, like I didn't have a computer at home when I was a kid. Like, and it wasn't mm -hmm. a, it just wasn't a thing. I graduated high school in 1998, right? I'm, I just turned 41 this past Wednesday. Um, so for me, like the computer, the internet, all that stuff was just not a part of my everyday thing. Right. And when I got to college, going to college and having a 24 hour computer lab uh, is mind blowing for someone mm -hmm. who is like, I grew up with like a lot of women in my family are educators. And so mm -hmm. I grew up with so many books and like at my mom's mm -hmm. house, there was a, these huge bookshelves, my grandmother's house, these huge bookshelves. Mm -hmm. And so I was an information junkie. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I got to college, I'm like, all this is on a computer. I'm spending all my free time there. And I'll never forget. Um, there was a guy at the time he was running for uh, student government president. And he was in the computer lab, maybe a row up for me. It's funny because we're actually like really close friends to the day, to this day. And he was creating a flyer on Microsoft Publisher. And I was like, that's the coolest thing ever. I had always <laughs> drawn when I was a kid, right? Mm. But for me, it was like, this will never leave the paper, right? It's <laughs> like, I have no idea how I could ever get this on a computer or anything like that. And I was like, this is so cool. And I asked him, I was like, what program is that? He's like, it's Microsoft Publisher. After that, I was hooked. And so mm. I just started doing graphic design. What ended up happening was I spent so much time there. People would look for me to do their flyers and stuff, right? <laughs> um, so I'm running for dorm queen. I'm running for homecoming queen. I'm running for this. I'm doing this. Can you help with this? And it just turned into like a legitimate side hustle. Mm. And in retrospect, I probably should have switched my major to graphic design. <laughs> but <laughs> I was already, I, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, I, do I really want to relearn this? Because I'm actually, I was a broke college kid and now I'm actually making money doing this. Uh, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't, <laughs> you know, disturb the wheel any. Um, and so I, I did that all throughout college. Uh, when I got out of college, I moved um, first to Birmingham, Alabama, and I worked there a little bit. And then I moved to Atlanta, Georgia. Um, uh, there I was working for a producer uh, that was one of the in-house producers for TI. Uh, so mm -hmm. I was doing, I was hired to do graphics for his company because he had his own projects that he was releasing, all these different things. Now, what's funny is in all of this time, 
I never thought about the concept of using these and selling my own products. Hmm. Right. It was always service based. Mm -hmm. And that's great. And it was wonderful until about 2008 when the market crashed Mm -hmm. Um, and we were in the middle of a recession. And I actually found myself taking more people to court, more of my clients to court to collect than actually Mm -hmm. getting new clients because everybody was broke. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so I had to start over uh, and I've had to reset a couple of times in life and it was it's totally fine. But it was about a year after that, because the, the other part of it was what I really wanted to do was I wanted to be a singer. Um, I put out several independent oh. albums, uh, oh, primarily nice. R&B, um, done pretty well overseas. Uh, uh, um, amazingly enough. Overseas, they appreciate American music more than Americans appreciate American music. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that seems about right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I put the first single that I put out was in July of 2009. And what was so interesting about it was the service that I used to uh, put the music out actually had an option with Amazon to where you could utilize their service called Create Space. So if somebody wanted to get the physical copy of your CD, they could order it through Amazon. Amazon create space would print it, pack it and ship it out. And that was the first mm. thing that I ever sold online was mm. actually music and it was Amazon and it was print on demand. That's awesome. And it did not dawn on me how full circle that was until maybe <laughs> like 2 years ago. Yeah, like 2 maybe 3 years ago, but I was like, wow, that's like completely full circle. That mm-hmm. that happened. After that, I was just like, okay, what else can I sell online? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to be, you know, but it's it's to me, I call it mailbox money because I'm like, okay, if I can do that, maybe I could do this. And then I started learning about eBay. And then I started learning about, you know, just like the reseller community. And I, I was like, okay, this is this is interesting. Um, I, I never really was a person that was just like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna take it just through the roof. But I was like, cause I still want to be a musician. And I still thought that the best way to make money was through service-based businesses. So I kind of teetered in and out of it for a few years until about 2015 when I started selling on Teespring. And uh, from there, you know, I, it was the old Teespring model where you do Facebook ads, you do, you know, you, you run curated groups, all those types of things. And some of those groups right. are still active. Uh, my Teespring account does still make money. Like I, well, it's spring now, but mm-hmm. um, it still makes money. Um, mm-hmm. I don't spend as much time as I used to with it, but um, and and then all this time, I did. I had no clue that merch by Amazon was even a thing. I had moved into private label, mm-hmm. and I'll never forget. This was 2016. It was October 10th, 2016, and I won't forget that because that was the date that they shut everybody down. Mm -hmm. I was at the time selling on eBay. Uh, I was selling Mm -hmm. on Teespring. Um, And I had another account for Amazon that I was doing um, retail arbitrage. Mm -hmm. Created another account to do this private label product. My fault was I waited until August to actually start and source these products. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. So in October, when my products are still caught up in customs in China, Mm -hmm get an email from Amazon on October 10th saying, if you have not created your first shipment by October 10th, (laughs) you cannot sell fulfilled by Amazon during the fourth quarter. I was like, you got to be kidding me. And (laughs) I had heard about, yeah, I'd heard about it. I'd heard about merch before from Glenn from the Merch Minds podcast when he was on Manny Coates podcast. But -hmm. again, I was so in private label mode. It didn't even dawn on me that, Hey, Amazon is now into the realm that you've already been selling with and doing decently well on Teespring. You should probably mm-hmm. look at that. I'm in private. I, I'm like, look, I'm looking for the million dollar Q4. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. right, right. And, right. and um, and and it just kind of went from there. So when they said you couldn't sell, I was like, okay, well, let me try merch by Amazon because they were talking about it in the group. I signed up. I didn't realize at the time there was a six month waiting period. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> now it's like two weeks. I'm like, you kids have no idea what we old whippersnappers have gone through. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> back in my day, <laughs> right? Back in my day, you had to wait five, six months for merch. But uh, <laughs> so I signed up, and then I signed up for Redbubble because I was like, I cannot waste this Q4. And thankfully, mm. Redbubble gave me an amazing amazing q4 which is one of the reasons i mm. kind of stepped into merch when i finally got in you know saying okay i know this isn't the end all be all there are other platforms yeah. out there that can legitimately yeah. provide a living for people yeah yeah so so nick a quick question while you were talking and you mentioned you wanted to be uh, a musician a singer uh, I did. I did a quick Google search, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I and I have to ask: Is this is this an album cover of yours? That oh my god, that is not <laughs> an album. Cover. That is my that is my Reverb Nation cover photo. Uh, Reverb okay. Nation was a site for musicians. So this is so. What's funny about this is that picture. <laughs> was taken the first time I went to New York. I got booked in 2007 um, by a, a, get, a guy named uh, DJ, DJ Dance, I want to say. And he booked me to perform at the Sugar Bar in Harlem, which was the uh, bar owned by Ashford and Simpson, the R&B duo from Motown. Hmm. Um, okay. And while I was there, I ran into someone. Um, she was the aunt of another R&B singer who had just recently released an album on Def Jam. And she was like, hey, listen, you need to go to this place, this place, this place. And, and gave me all these places to perform. This was at Village Underground. Hmm. And so okay. I took the picture and then I grabbed that for the, the background guys from the website. And I used that as my um, I use that <laughs> as my cover photo on Reverb Nation That's and then awesome. another page called our stage well That's you heard awesome. it here first folks uh yeah nick we have multi uh national <laughs> recording artist nick recording Eden artist, on the print on the exactly. main cast and you gotta <laughs> I watch say it. this i'll say this i have not performed or i have not performed written or recorded uh since 2014 so wow. a little rusty <laughs> so, it sounds like so so travis and i always always kind of dream about what it would be like to have a pod gathering weekend summit whatever but it sounds mm. like should that ever happen mm. that there needs to be a karaoke night with the three of us yeah throwing down some some karaoke perhaps some harmonies i, I, I think it needs it. it needs to happen i think it needs to happen i'd love it i'd are you love it. are you in nick are you in i'm in okay, <laughs> I'm in. Let's okay. that sounds good we'll back up and let's get it done i i'm 100 percent in all right, sounds awesome. good. Well, well, you heard it here first. Again, uh, there's all kinds of scoops on the POD cast uh, <laughs> this week. And you have to watch the YouTube video version to see that picture that we're talking about as my yeah, quick fingers like Google. pounds ago. As, as, <laughs> <laughs> as soon as he said R&B artist, I opened a separate tab and just Googled because I needed to find uh, <laughs> evidence of this mm -hmm. and, and hopefully – uh, we can, you know, if there's any music still out there, Nick, we can definitely uh, oh, yeah. put that out there as well. Because I would love, I legitimately would love to hear it um, yeah. as well. So um, we talked about kind of your origins uh, and, and how you kind of got started in, in all of this. And I've heard recently that you're doing some fulfillment for influencers, which is intriguing to me because, uh, you know, Travis and I have our own separate print companies where we do the production and mine. Uh, at the moment is doing a lot of work with influencers as well and fulfilling mm -hmm. for influencers. Mm -hmm. So how does that work for you? Uh, you know, and what does that look like um, on your end for fulfilling for influencers? Um, so it comes in two ways. Um, the first is I'm a big believer in. So for context, yeah. uh, when I decided that I was going to do a podcast, you know, I, teetered back and forth about should I incorporate YouTube into this? Because I was like, it's one thing to try to grow a podcast and try to grow a YouTube channel. I sure. had my YouTube channel legitimately since 2006. I just never did anything with it. Mm -hmm. So when I made the decision in early 2018 that I would do it, I was like, okay, they had already changed all of the, you know, the, the, the partner guidelines and, and all that because I was a monetized partner on YouTube at one time before mm. 
that guy who mm-hmm. I won't speak of, you know, <laughs> took a video or something that we won't talk about and screwed it up for a lot of <laughs> YouTube <laughs> YouTubers out there. Um, but I was like, OK, well, I recognize the power of a small, dedicated audience. And so what I ended up doing was I reached out to some micro influencers because, you know, especially on YouTube, you can't do um, you can't have the merch shelf until you've reached 10,000 subscribers. OK, um, mm. but we obviously all the, all the three of us know how important things like merch are to people who are, you know, building content. Uh, yeah. We know how much of a, an actual asset it can be. And for me, I knew what it was like because even though I wasn't selling merch, just on affiliates, I, when I had, it's funny because I made more money with YouTube when I had 300 <laughs> subscribers than I do now. Um, <laughs> I was making at peak like 200 bucks off affiliate sales a month. Wow. Right. So I went to a few of these folks that I knew. Uh, a few of them are actors. They are like sketch actors on like, they're on YouTube and they're, you know, they're yeah. actors out in LA, but they still do, you know, build their own content on YouTube, TikTok, and Facebook. Mm-hmm. And I was like, listen, I can do the fulfillment on your orders. Um, even if it's something as simple as setting up a spring store for them, which again, because we're in the industry, we take for granted that most people have no clue what yeah. this is. Sure. They just they sure. don't. Um, and so I went to a few of them, they said yes. Um, there were a few, and I was like, okay, well. At first, I wasn't going to be, I, for me, because they were friends, I was like, listen, I'm just going to do this for you because I think this is something that you need. And they're like, well, look, how much do you charge? And I'm like, I'm not really charging anybody. It's just, again, we're fr- because we're friends, sure. right? So they're like, no, 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 I, w- I want to pay you. I'm like, okay, give me 250 bucks just to set just to set everything up for you. I can do an yeah, initial right. round of designs for you, and and then you can just kind of take it from there. Um, And that actually turned into a business model because what would end up happening was they would suggest someone and then someone else would suggest someone. And so Mm -hmm. it was a lot of one offs, which I'm totally fine with. But, you know, it's still one of those situations where it's like, okay, I know that the concept works. Right. So if I set up your spreadsheet, you know, and I primarily with those type of the micro influencers, I'll use uh, spring or spreadsheet. Right. Okay. If they want to get into something a little bit more where they're a, a bigger actor or actress or something like that, then we'll go the Shopify route, WooCommerce, Squarespace, those types of things. That mm-hmm. turned into an entirely separate business model for me because I have, you know, I still work full time. Um, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. I have a great job. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't, you know, I, I it would literally take me making probably about three times what I make at my yeah. job for me to leave. Um, mm-hmm. plus they pay for all my health insurance. So anyway, um, <laughs> those benefits, <laughs> right. But it's primarily in the political space, which has done wonders sure. for me in terms of, in terms of, uh, t-shirt ideas and different mm-hmm. niches. But I also mm-hmm. know a lot of social and, you know, social justice groups and civil liberties groups that they don't have merch. And I'm like, right. you have to realize you have some of the most passionate supporters yep. in the country. So for you to not have a, a merch store, that's crazy, especially when you have, you know, the the organizations that are national organizations and they have local chapters. I'm like, mm-hmm. you're really leaving a lot here. Oh, well, we screen print. And then I told him, I was like, listen, um, and I, I only did this for one person because they were in Atlanta. I said, where's all of your current inventory? It's in our storage unit. It's down the street from the office. <laughs> I said, I'm mm-hmm. going to come up there next week. And we're going to go into the storage unit and I'm going to show you how much money you're losing by having your inventory sitting there. And when I tell you, because they do this big national convention every year, this was earlier this year. They still had shirts from like 2010, 2011. Oh my gosh. And they're just sitting there. And I knew what was going to happen. I was like, (laughs) you order a lot of smalls. It's, never fails because i used to work for a <laughs> casino down here and i was in charge of the, the orders for all of them. i always just say nick you never order a lot of smalls i'm like most people are fat like i'm sorry like <laughs> just the, the reality is most people are not going to get a small and it's always the smalls that are left over right mm-hmm. and of course yep. it's the same thing with them that 
all the way back to 2010, 2011. I said, this is how much money you're leaving on the table right now. Add to the fact that the only thing that's in this storage unit are these shirts. So <laughs> not just the cost for the shirts, but the cost that you're paying every month to store these. This is how much money you're leaving on the table. And I just kind of did a breakdown. Um, I actually created this a, a few years ago when, um, I don't know, if, are you all familiar with Mike Wall? Mike Wall, uh, no, yeah. No. yeah, yeah, I do. I know Mike Wall. Yeah, the business to business guy that did used merch at the right. tire store and the pizza stores and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So when Mike started first really making his, and I just called it, you know, it was, it was, I, he gave it another stamp. It was just something I had mm. always kind of done. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember I made a a, a, a free download. For anybody that just was on my Gumroad page, I said I think I actually got a download of it, even though it's terribly out of date now. But <laughs> where I just kind of broke it down, and so I brought that sheet with me, and I broke it down. I was like, "Listen, if you went the PLD model, we could do this, 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 and this." And they were like, "Can you do this store? Can you do a merch store for us for under a thousand dollars?" I said, uh, "Well, it depends." <laughs> I said, um, <laughs> "How many designs do you want up? Um, what kind of turnaround do you want on this store?" Uh, and what kind of maintenance do you need for it? They're like, look, mm -hmm. I don't know the questions. To, I don't know the answers to any of that. This is not my wheelhouse. I said, mm -hmm. okay, I'll do it. Um, and I, and I, I, the only reason I'm not saying their name is because obviously there's, you know, there NDAs, things like that. Sure. Uh, so, but I ended up doing a store for, I just charged them 750 bucks to do the store. I set up a Shopify site for them. I used their logo. I, I um, used some mock-ups that I got from Place It. Uh, some videos that they could use for promotion. Um, and that was the initial setup. And they paid me 150 bucks to update it. And essentially, whenever they want to add something to it, I just go in and add it. Mm -hmm. And I'm mean, like literally for about 30 minutes worth of work. I got that site up in an app in an afternoon. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah. this is a model that is I'm like, if I can just take this and systemize this for the micro influencers at this price and then for the social service groups at this price, this is something mm -hmm. that I can take. And I don't have to worry about finding the next dabbing Santa, the next, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, pinata riding chili pepper. And I'm yeah. saying these stuff because I've actually designed these and sold them before. <laughs> but I'm like, I just made you know, more money in one afternoon doing that than yeah. all the time that I've spent trying to do the rat race of this. And, and again, don't get me wrong. I'm still doing merch. I'm still doing niche research. I'm still doing all of that. Yeah. But mm -hmm. here, I, I can't ignore what's on this side. This is. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, for sure. It's an amazing opportunity. Yeah, there's a there's a ton of uh, opportunity out there. There's a ton of businesses that that and and like you said, like social social groups and, you know, political groups and activist groups and all those those places. They need they need somebody like us to come alongside of them and kind of share what we know and give them an opportunity. So I'm curious, um, how do you determine? Uh, so so for this, let's just use this one example that you use with Shopify. First of all, are, are you. Uh, did you just like tie them in directly to Printful and they're paying Printful or are you going to be a middleman in this and, and capture some of the dollars on the fulfillment as well? Um, and then the secondary question is, is how do you determine which one of those models you're going to do if in fact you're doing both of them? Uh, so good question. Um, the, the first part of that is I just a straight up build out of the site is, the main thing and mm -hmm. then the maintenance i don't I, I don't middleman myself between them and printful um okay. what i do is i set it up for them um we do a a, a a forward on the site to weird mass to their um to their website and then i just let it go from there and whenever they need something you know i keep i have a retainer where mm -hmm. i charge them between between 100 and 150 bucks a month uh you know I'm, i can i can work with most budgets but the, for the convenience of being able to go in, make some changes on the site, add an article or, mm -hmm. you know, add a new type of shirt to or a new product to the merch store. To me, that's worth it. it again, are, you, are, you, are you doing design for that as well or are they giving you designs and you're just doing the mock ups for their designs? That's the beautiful part. Most of them already have all of the logos that they're going to do. Right. Cool. So if, if they have a new initiative, it's just if they have their main logo 
or a new initiative that they're, excuse me, that they're starting. For me, I'm not, and the reason that I got out of full-time graphic design to begin with was because dealing with the client portion in that, there is, there are a few groups that realistically, if they said, hey, can you design a logo for uh, this initiative? Then I would consider doing that. But for the most part, I feel like this is the most seamless relationship possible. You Mm. already have what you need in terms of the visuals. I just got to make it to where it's commerce. It's it's some of the most stress-free, beautiful business relationships I've ever had. (laughs) That's, That's why amazing. I don't get involved with like the middleman part of the money. Like this is so it's like the most Zen thing I've, <laughs> I've ever yeah. done in business. Yeah. yeah. So so there are there people, I know you you mentioned doing some spring stores and some uh, spreadshirt stores. Are is it the same thing where you're just like setting up a, a spring account in their name and then it all flows through them? You're not in the middle of any of these things. Yeah, I'm not in the middle of any of those things, um, okay. particularly with the micro influencers, because m- most of them, you know, they kind of they have their platforms and they know where they want to go with it. They just need the vehicle for it. So mm-hmm. I just provide the vehicle. I do it. A, it's just a one off. And I mean, the rea- let's be honest. The reality is if they could Google and do it themselves. I just yep. I'm, sure. I'm the convenience factor for them. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Right. Yeah. I, and, I, I I say that all the time where a lot of people will pay for something that that they don't know how to do. They could learn. They could take the time to learn to do that themselves. But we, f- we forget the convenience factor where they're willing to pay a, a Nick or, or myself or Travis to do it for them. So they don't have to dedicate that brain power to learning how to do it as simple as, or as it may be, but they'll pay for the convenience of not having to worry about it. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. Uh, I know Josiah, um, you guys are doing some influencer, you know, yeah. or you're working with some influencers as well, but it's a different model for you. Yeah. You guys have the, the productions all in house. Yeah. Right? So it's a little bit of a different vibe. Yeah. But I think this is an excellent, I mean, I think you could probably go either way. Um, mm-hmm. I, I know another company that uh, has some ends with some, some NFL players that have like their own branding and things like that. And they set up Shopify stores for them and then same kind of thing that you're doing, Nick. And then they, um, you know, they get production places to, um, you know, I've been in contact with them and, and have a couple of their players, you know, uh, we're, we're fulfilling for them and they take a cut out of the middle. So they, you know, say you'll make this much and then they, you know, pay me and then they take that cut. And I, I, right. I'm not sure if they set up the stores for free. Um, as kind of their hook or if they also charge for the stores but i just there's so many different ways you can you know you can go with this uh there's a lot of different ways you can make money um you know with the these these business opportunities so so nick why don't you kind of um give us maybe some tips if if i wanted you know if i'm i'm new to pod i don't i mean maybe i'm in here 10 you know i just got into it what what kind of what kind of questions or what kind of um, things am I going to say to that, you know, that business owner down the street that doesn't really know anything about print on demand. And I want to be their, you know, uh, their assistant, you know, and, and, and making this happen for them. If it's, you know, whichever, whichever direction you're going to go, or whichever model you're going to go with, if you're going to take a piece of the, the merch, or if you're just going to charge an upfront cost to set up the shop or whatever it is, how do I approach them? What are the questions I need to ask? What do I need to get, uh, you know, what, what do I need to communicate with them to have them be able to trust me with something like this? Good question. Um, well, first I will say this, I haven't had to cold call in a while, uh, thankfully. (laughs) So, but if I were cold calling, um, and I am a 10 tier seller on in the merch program, that's even better. Uh, and the reason that I say that is because for me, I just know that somebody is more likely to understand Amazon as opposed to Spreadshirt or Spring that they've never heard uh, okay. of before. Mm, right. Yeah. Sure. Um, sure. So I would probably approach that person and, you know, I would say, you know, I, I would 
ask them about their um, about their employees, about how many employees they have, um, and just express to them, I, you know, listen, I'm a I'm a design vendor with Amazon.com's uh, Merch by Amazon program. Um, I'd like to see about saving you some costs on your uh, uniform inventory, your your T-shirt inventory, by utilizing uh, an Amazon model on it. Now, again, I haven't had a cold call in a while, so forgive me if I'm a little <laughs> rusty. Um, but essentially, not in a role play method, but how I would explain it to them is that the money that they spend on inventory and having to do minimum orders, which is why a lot of them like to stay away from it, they can actually cut that out. I would Mm -hmm. then present them with a one sheet of all the products that Amazon offers. Mm -hmm. Uh, So basically all you have to do is really just take the mock-ups that are in your merch account, you know, Mm -hmm. screenshot them and put them into it. Hey, this is this and this is this. With an Amazon model, I definitely would take a piece of it. Obviously, you will overprice it a little bit. And I say overprice it, but like a standard shirt probably go for like $25.99. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and and take a piece from there. It you don't have to do a large chunk of it because it's also benefiting you because as people buy, you're gonna tear up. Right. Um, yeah. after show I would I would have that one sheet prepared to show them. Just ask them if you know if I could have a few minutes of your time, see if I can save you a little bit on your inventory cost and keep you from spending so much money on t shirts. Um, and then I will present it to them in another way. Um, and this is something that I actually did with a pizza shop in Marietta, uh, Georgia, right before I moved back to the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Um, I was already working with them supplying their pizza box toppers. Um, mm-hmm. That pizza box top is a business that I think people really sleep on. But essentially, I was providing their box toppers for them. Free of charge, you know, I would I get them 10,000 box toppers at a time and then I would design about a quarter of the page I would use for any of the coupons that they wanted to offer, provided that they would let me use the other three quarters of the page that I could sell for advertising. So the Hmm. reason that this worked was because this is one of the only types of advertising that people invite into their homes. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. People generally will get those pizza box toppers. And if it's like, hey, order three large pizzas and you get a, you know, a, a free order of breadsticks, people are going to take that. They're going to put a magnet on it. They're going to put it on, um, right. on their refrigerator or at the very least it's going to be at the top of their junk drawer in the kitchen. But they're going to see it. I went back to the pizza shop and said, listen, if you wanted to just make this one, let's do this for your uniform so you're not spending a lot of money on inventory. But also, let's make one where if people, let's take one of those coupon spaces, and if people purchase a shirt, they'll get 20% off on the next order if they wear it into the shop. And I told yeah. them, I said, that way, they'll be a walking billboard for your business, Definitely. and you're going to make money off of them buying the shirt. Yeah. And that, I, you know, That's like, genius, man. He was like, "That's wonderful." <laughs> he was like, "Let's let's take the uh, what was they would let's take the garlic knots off of there and put the t-shirt on there." <laughs> and and so we got it up on uh, Amazon and we got the uh, what was it the uh, the QR code? I made a QR code okay. for it so I could yeah. take people right to it. I yeah. mean, and it, it it was that simple. Wow! And, and I just That's, showed them like, here, here's how much money you made every month. I don't mind because they don't know anything about other T-shirt business. Look, these are the shirts that you sold, and this is how much you right. made, and this is you know minus my yeah. percentage. This is your payout. They don't care yeah. about the dabbing turtle. <laughs> so I have no problem showing they, them my account. Right? Yeah, that's awesome. That's amazing. That's uh, that's super awesome. I I, I wanted we had Yong on uh, recently, and we talked to him. We we're talking about merch by Amazon, and. Um, uh, one of the questions we asked him was, you know, give us some tips for somebody who's caught in that tier 10, tier 25, merch by Amazon, you know, black hole. <laughs> and so my question to you is, do you do you feel like this is the best way to get out of tier 10, tier 25? Um, or or if not, maybe there's some other tips that you'd you know, be willing to share with, with our listeners? I feel like, with, with the competition that's going on right now, um, as more and more sellers are getting into merch, uh, 
I genuinely feel like this is the best way to do it. Hmm. But I do feel like that this is a role that won't be traveled often. Right. Yeah. It's hard. It's, it's not low hanging fruit, you know? Right. Exactly. Yeah. So this would be the way that I would suggest folks do it. Mm -hmm. But I understand that most people will not go that way. I'll yeah. say this. If I had to give you a tried and true method that works. So again, for context, I'm in a music fraternity and a lot of my fraternity brothers are high school and middle school band directors. Mm -hmm. um, and I, it, my oldest daughter, she's in band. And one thing that is universal across the board in almost every city across this country, the band boosters hate t-shirts because they spend <laughs> a lot of money. Yep. They spend a lot of money and people do not get the shirts. So mm. if I had to give you a, just a, easy win for b2b <laughs> and you're in that 10 tier i would say go to the high school talk to the band director ask if you can get in touch with the band booster president and talk because at this point a lot of them don't even want to do shirts at all mm -hmm. and just say hey listen i have a solution for you because let's be honest most of band parents it's again, it's that social proof of Amazon. Mostly everybody whose parents are in the, uh, everybody who is a, a parent, they got an Amazon Prime account. Mm -hmm. yep. Almost everyone. Or if yep. they don't, they know someone who does. And say, listen, we will place these on Amazon. People can buy them. Whoever buys them and comes to the function with their shirt on, they got it. If they don't, they don't. Period. <laughs> Most, especially if you tell them, and, and if this is just about getting out of the, the tent here, you know, just say, listen, I won't charge you up front. We'll just take whatever the logo is, put it on the shirt and go from there. Now, there's there's an interesting part to this now. Mm -hmm. um, you also have to keep in mind, especially with Amazon, that they are not playing when it comes to any type of trademark infringement. Yeah. You know? So if you have. You, you're going to have to provide some type of proof that you can actually do that. I've done this for band boosters before through Teespring and even Teespring is as, as, as many P for P copies as they get uh, mm -hmm. copycats as they get. <laughs> I still had to send documentation <laughs> to Teespring saying, Hey, he's good to go using this. So yeah. cover your bases with that. But that's yeah. one of the easiest ways that you can do it. It's it's, it's one of the easiest ways because it's not a situation where you're walking into, uh, you know, a brick and mortar business where they have a secretary or another person who's set up to be a gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. They are literally looking for the best way to get the band's image and, and awareness out there at the, the, you know, the, the, the lowest cost. And for what it's worth, these band boosters, these parents, they will spend a lot of money. <laughs> Trust me, like my band, the band boosters at my daughter's high school are set to spend well over a half million dollars this year uh, on the wow. band. So that would be like the easiest way that, for me. But I know some people are just still going to want to go and, you know, do a dabbing shirt. So <laughs> <laughs> I only get on dabbing because I can't believe people are still buying dabbing shirts for whatever reason in <laughs> Germany, I keep selling these dabbing shirts and I can't understand why on earth people are still buying this. Stuff. Like it's the, five the, years fad, the fad is just slowly migrating over <laughs> to, to Germany. And like there's a five year delay. Maybe. I don't know. Right. It's funny. Pop sockets are still huge in Munich. I don't know what's happening, but it's, it's right. Really exactly. <laughs> So, Nick, we're going to move uh, to a set of questions that we ask every interviewee here on the POD cast. Okay. Uh, something that we just came up with a nice uh, bumper for uh, right before we pressed record. So, we're going to go straight to the uh, magic questions. We'll see if that gets by you to police uh, when we post it later. <laughs> if not, we'll have to we'll have to pivot. But uh, I don't I don't care. I think it's funny. So uh, the magic questions. <laughs> so for the first one, man, tell us about a time uh, when something happened in your business that felt like a failure. You said you've had to kind of re regroup and restart a couple times. Um, but tell us what what one of those instances was like when you felt like, man, 
Mm. I don't know where I go from here. August of 2016. Uh, I'll never forget. So in the midst of getting into POD and still pursuing music, this opportunity to go into event marketing dropped on me in like 2010. Um, and that turned into that experience because I worked primarily with the U S bank, um, pushing the Harley Davidson visa Mm -hmm. that turned into an opportunity with a tobacco company who wanted to do sampling at some of the bike rallies, but they had no idea what they were doing. Um, Mm -hmm. my wife and I started a marketing agency and I mean, this was legitimately a six figure check over the course of two months. That business ran from 2013 to 2016. The mistake that we made was that 75% of the business was based around tobacco sampling. Um, and, And the crash happened and it happened really hard because in August of 2016, they changed the federal regulations for tobacco sampling and they put cigars and little cigars in the same category as cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And so you could no longer hand out, uh, you could no longer hand out free samples of the Mm -hmm. cigars. Uh, And that also included pipe tobacco. They just grouped everything into one category. And for what it's worth, it was already a bit of a a, a moral conflict for me. Mm -hmm. Listen, I I don't judge anybody for what they do. But I lost my grandmother to lung cancer. So it's always mm. a bit of a moral conflict for me when it when it came to that. But this sure. was still a significant portion of income for the business. And we tried to revamp. We tried to, you know, say, okay, well, maybe we can work on a sales model, a POS model, which for me was like, okay, this is cool. I can create POS. This is this is fine. I've done this before. And they were just like, no, we're just gonna move on. It, you know, we're just not gonna do it anymore. Mm-hmm. And I mean. 75% of our business's income was wiped out by wow. one federal regulation. Ouch. Yeah, that's painful. I, I learned two things from that. Um, the first thing I learned was that, and I've not done it since, that I would never have more than 10% of my income come from one source. Mm-hmm. That was the first thing that I learned. The second thing that I learned was I need to really get and dig into this product-based part of the business because for service-based businesses, the fourth quarter was usually the worst time. Everybody's doing all their fiscal planning. Nobody's spending a lot of money unless it's something specifically geared towards the winter seasons. And we were doing festivals. That's all spring. It was the worst Mm -hmm. time of year for us. Meanwhile, my buddies that had really gotten into reselling and private label were making six figures in the fourth quarter alone. So I was like, (laughs) we got to get into the product side of this. So those were two very important things that I learned. Yeah, those are huge. I mean, you know, the whole diversification, we talk a lot about that on the podcast, you know. Um, You know, it's not smart to have all your eggs in one basket, especially as, as we've said, a basket as volatile as Amazon in particular. Uh, you know, I mean, you hear sus- poor stories, suspensions, all of that stuff on the Amazon seller central side. And then you hear of account shutdowns on Etsy and merch by Amazon, and they don't really give a reason. And, you know, I mean, so yeah, I, di- diversification is, is, is super important. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a, that's a great reminder for our biz, you know, our, our, our listeners just, Hey, you know, let's be thinking about this and making plans, not just thinking about it, but actually making plans to diversify if this is, in fact, something that you want to do long term. Um, all right. So let's we're getting long on time. So let's jump right let's into one more, our, right? Yeah, let's just do one more. Let's do the crystal ball question. Yes, so Nick, yes. put on your little, you know, your little hat, you know, and from, I don't know, ancient times and look into your little crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what is that hat called? You know what I'm talking about? The one that the genie wears or whatever. Anyway, what do you think the future of print on demand is? And this can be, you can, you can like answer this from whatever direction you want to, if you want to answer it from, yeah. you know, the provider side or from the producer side or from the customer side, you know, what do you think the future of print on demand is? What does it look like? I think the future of print on demand is regional. Hmm. Here's here's the reason I say this. 
There are so many giants. I would say right now, um, and from a marketplace standpoint, that Amazon right now does have the title of king of print on demand. Hmm. Um, fulfillment wise, I would say Printful has that title. Um, as these companies get bigger and bigger, and as they're as we kind of have this backlash, I guess you could say, on major conglomerates, I think we're going to see the 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 rise of more and more smaller businesses being embraced and people really digging into their regional economy. I saw this a lot. One of the clients, I, we used to run a demo program for Whole Foods under the marketing agency. And the energy that you would see from the folks where it was really important that their foods were produced locally, you know, that they supported the local growers, mm. you know, the energy I, I've seen that kind of transition into other things. One of the things I get a lot of times on Etsy is, you know, particularly after the protests last summer and, and uh, a, a very public incident that happened with a pretty prominent Etsy and merch seller. Um, I started getting people all the time. Hey, um, because one of these, one of my Etsy stores is primarily based around African culture mm-hmm. and heritage. And, you know, at least once a week for the longest, it'd be like, Hey, are you, is this a black owned business? I used to have to send selfies <laughs> to people <laughs> so they wow. would know, right. That it was actually me. Yes. I'm actually me and I'm actually black. Can you believe it? Yeah. But, <laughs> um, you know, but just kind of, a, I, I've, I've seen it happen um, in, in, in the area of produce. I've seen it happen with music. I think that what's going to eventually happen is some of these companies just get so big that people are going to be looking for the the smaller, more customer service based, mm. faster services. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. if I, I've said time and time again, you know, one of my ultimate goals is to have my own fulfillment center, and largely because after a while, you know, Printful gets too big. No mm. disrespect to them, you know. Sure. I listen. You're supposed to want to grow your business, right? That's sure. we're sure. all in yep. business to grow, right? Yep. At a certain point, though, you know, you become too large to pivot. And I think customer service Hmm. will lack in that area because of it. And that more that smaller, more regional kind of feel like are you guys familiar with the store Big Frog? Yep, I am. I know Big Frog. Listen, um, for the longest, Big Frog was my go to because if we had an event and we went to a city, I knew. I could get shirts done for this, yeah. you know, in a day mm-hmm. that means something to people, you know, it means something to people to know that, okay, it's here, it's local. I can reach out and I can touch you. And I do think that that may be the, the, the future of print on demand, man, Nick, this is my favorite answer as a small <laughs> business owner, as a small, yeah. as a, as a local regional producer of merch or of print on demand products, I freaking love that answer. And uh, it gives me hope. So thank you, man. You're making me making me all, you know, warm and fuzzy inside. <laughs> hey, listen, man, the, the big ones are going to get so big, man. The bubble, the bubble eventually bursts. And it, yeah. it's, it's up it's, to the smaller ones that can pivot to uh, it, make the change. Yeah, it's really funny, though, because, I mean, most of the people that uh, come on a show and we ask that question, they say the exact opposite. They say, yeah, the mom and pop shops, it's going to be hard for them to compete against the big printful and the printify. And, and I don't know about you, Josiah, but my, my numbers don't show that, you know, <laughs> like we keep getting more and more people. And to yeah. your point, Nick, it's, you know, a lot of it's local. It's just people that they need to have a face behind yep. the sale. You know, they want to have a phone, a phone conversation before they swipe their credit card or whatever. So, yeah. um, so I, you know, I definitely, you know, who knows what the future is and, you know, mad respect for all of our past, you know, people who have come on and said opposite things or, or things that are different than that. But I tend to agree with you. I do think (laughs) as, as, as things expand, we, as people want to get smaller, you know, we want those, those inner, those connections. And uh, so, yeah, man, that's, that's a that's that's my favorite answer. Yeah. You won the prize. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Awesome. Well, Nick, before we wrap things up uh, again, <laughs> thank you for taking time for uh, coming on the show. But Definitely. if people want to find out more about uh, your podcast, more about your projects, what you got going on, where can they find you? I want to give you a couple minutes here at the end to just plug and promote away, give links, give <laughs> sites, social media handles, what have you, so people can find more of your content and uh, glean off of more of your wisdom as they have in this episode. Absolutely. So um, you can, uh, depending on your social media outlet of choice, you can follow me on Instagram at Nick Eden. You can follow me on Facebook, Nick Eden Print on Demand, TikTok at Nick Eden, uh, Clubhouse at Nick Eden, and YouTube at Nick Eden. The beautiful thing about it is on all of those platforms, there's a link tree. Um, and yeah. you can just click that link mm. tree and it yeah. will take you to all the other destinations. Perfect. Um, each of them serve their own purpose. Right now on my uh, Instagram uh, page, I'm doing a Q4 30 day challenge. I was actually out at a log cabin last night, so I didn't get yesterday's video up, but I'm t- putting up two today. But um, it's, you know, with 30 days out, well, less, at this point, less than 30 days out from Q4. And so mm-hmm. each day is an accountability day, and that's exclusive to uh, my Instagram. On TikTok, as well as Instagram, you'll see a lot of my uh, tutorials. I do these little quick minute tutorials on using the GoDaddy Studio app to create designs. And then on YouTube, you kind of get everything. You get the video version of Morning Cup of Merch. Uh, you get another series that I started called Rate Merch, where I go through and rate different print-on-demand platforms mm. um, and just all the content I've been putting out for years. And as long as people still want the content and as long as I can still provide actual value to folks, I'm going to keep doing it. Awesome. Well, thank you again, man, for coming on. And it, for those of you listening, please go follow Nick on all of those platforms. Um, as you can tell, he's got a lot of, of good information and some approaches to stuff that might be outside the traditional box that you might have been approaching things from. I know Mm -hmm. there's been a lot in this episode that I've even thought like, wow, that's a really cool way to come up to approach this idea that some people are are thinking of in a more conventional way for lack of a better term. So Nick, thank you so much for coming on the show. And I look forward to our um, karaoke night. That is, that is paying. It's it's going to happen. (laughs) I am totally with it. Thank y'all for having me. Yeah, man. Thank you so much. We'll talk soon. Well, there you have it, folks. The rebroadcast of episode 55, our interview with Nick Eden. Such a great interview. If this is your first time listening to it, I hope you enjoyed it. If it's your second time, go listen for a third time or a fourth time or a fifth time. Uh, So much to learn here. And go follow Nick on all of his social media platforms as well. Morning Cup of Merch, the podcast. Just go support everything that he's doing. Um, And uh, we look forward to having him back on the show, hopefully sometime very soon. And we very much look forward to dropping new content next week. Thank you guys so much for your patience. I know... Um, you know, sometimes schedules and, and circumstances don't allow us to necessarily do everything that we like to do. Uh, we do not like to do rebroadcasts, but when we do, we try to bring you the best of what we have in the archives again, which is why Nick Eden's episode was the go-to for me to pick and uh, kind of throw out there again for you guys to enjoy and to learn from. So thank you guys so much for your patience. Um, as always, if you have questions, info at printondemandcast.com is where you can go. Printondemandcast.com is now live. It is alive and well. Uh, and that's where you can find the merch store. That I'm telling you guys the easiest way to support the show. Just go pick up a shirt. Uh, everything we make is always reinvested back into this show. So if you like the content, you like what you're getting, and you want to support Please value yourself, printondemandcast.com. Uh, you can do that. Of course, we also have uh, the Print on Demand cast on social media, printondemandcast.com slash Instagram, uh, printondemandcast.com slash Facebook, and printondemandcast.com slash YouTube is where you can find all of our social media content channels. Uh, throw us a follow, a like, join the Facebook group. We always tell you to do that, but we're very excited to see activity and engagement happening there as well. And wherever there are podcasts, the POD cast is there for you. The other way to support the show in an easy, easy way is just to leave a five-star review on the iTunes uh, podcast app. Uh, Let people know what you're loving. Let us know what you're loving, what you want to hear more of. And this just helps the algorithm get this content in front of more people like yourself that need to hear what's happening on this show. So With that being said, thank you guys again so much for your patience for being with us. We look forward to being back next week. Uh, So on behalf of Travis, I'm Josiah, and we'll see you next week right here on the Print on Demand cast.